don't know. Sometimes I feel like I have not uh, forgiven my mom. I still, I still harbor a lot of um, anger towards her. So for me, I think there was so much that happened with her where I felt just as a child or as an individual, as a daughter, I did not feel loved by her. And she knew that. She knew that I didn't feel loved by her. So the only time I ever felt like she would protect me is when she caught Tony raping me. Like when she caught Tony like literally on top of me and she like hit him in the head with a skillet and then she called the police and then she just kind of like put me in the tub and she was like, are you okay? And just, you know, like that was the only time I ever felt like she cared. I think eventually I get to the full place of forgiveness. When? I don't know. Welcome to a new episode of Friendship Full Circle with me, your host, Marshawn Frencha. To open us up and to prepare us for today's conversation, we will do what I believe is necessary when we have these types of conversations is to breathe to center. It is my thought that when we consciously and practice deep breathing, that it opens us up to listen and understand different levels of conversation. So if you can, place your feet front ground on the floor. And it is my thought that when you sit your feet on the floor, that you create a level of grounding and a deeper connection to the earth and the universe. And next, I want you to place your palms on your knees and sit up straight. Now, if you can't do this part of the show, find somewhere safe to do it when you can, because I want you to be safe when you are doing this. Now, what I want you to do next is to exhale all the air out of your lungs and exhale all the air out of your body. Now, we are going to breathe into our diaphragm and exhale from our diaphragm. So when you breathe, your stomach should fill up. And when you exhale, your stomach should contract. So when you are ready, begin by inhaling slowly. Hold your breath. And exhale, contracting your stomach. Inhale, deep into your stomach, into your diaphragm. Hold it. And then exhale. We're going to do one more cycle of breath. And inhale. Holding it. And now exhale. Now on this next cycle of breath, we're gonna do a quick body scan of our full body. We're gonna use our breath to release any tension that may be in our body right now. So start at your feet, working your way up. So check on your toes, the heels of your feet, your ankles and moving up down to your calves, the lower regions of your legs, next to your knees, your thighs. Now move up to your pelvic floor, your waist and your hips your abdomen and like I said we're finding any tension that may be arising in the body using our breath to release it and let it go by now you should move up to your 
elbows, your biceps, and your tricep muscles of your arms, your chest, and next we'll move up to your neck, the back of your neck, the nape of your neck, your chin. Let's move up to the face, your lips, your nose, behind your eyes, your ears, your forehead, and now your scalp. Just if there's any tension, like I say, use your breath to release it. Now, remember, like I said, breathing is a vital part of our human experience. And when things arise for you or tension or any negative feeling arises, you can use your breath. You don't have to stay in that energy. You can use your breath to release it and let it go, allowing it to not hold you hostage anymore and when you are ready you can open your eyes and come back to this state of consciousness I thank you and now we can begin today's show thank you on today's episode we are here to talk about mother wounds Mother wounds are something that many of us have and struggle with. Inspired by the ongoing back and forth between Monique and her son, I decided to talk about and do an episode that oftentimes in the black community can be very taboo to speak on. Talking about the wounds of a parent, let alone the wound from your mother. For so many of us, to speak on your mother wound can be a very scary and frightening thing to do. From an early age, we are taught to move in relationship with our parents without acknowledging their actions and their effects on our behavior into adulthood. But it's my intent on today's show with my guest, which is my own mother, on the show that this is the catalyst for mothers and their children to have open conversations, heal past wounds, and find tools to build healthier, loving family relationships. So to have this conversation, I have brought on my own mother, um, she is a writer, she is a artist, she is a singer, she is, she's so many things to me. But I thought it'd be great to have my own mother come on the show because we, me and my own mom, we have a, I feel like our relationship has grown a lot stronger and we had our own breakdown in communication one time, but I feel like from that breakdown, it has opened the door to a more more loving and nurturing relationship between the two of us and it also opened my eyes to want to commend my mother because there are things that i did not know about my mother growing up as far as like her family and her upbringing and i'm always fascinated by my mom and how she is as a person and so just to like hear her speak about her own upbringing and you you I feel like when you have that conversation with your parent or when you hear your parents story you you understand more where they've come from you have a better understanding of how they are as a parent to you and I commend my that's why I said I commend my mother because despite all the odds and the adversity that she had faced growing up. And even though, also too, I think sometimes we can sometimes be confused where we want our parents to be perfect, but when you understand what your parents, if you have a, if you have a relationship like you have with me and my mom, when you have a parent that has been through what they went through, you grow an appreciation for them and you really commend them because, like I said, despite all the odds, 
they did a great and phenomenal job with raising children. The conversation today is about mother wounds. And so I would want to ask you, first mom, what is your mother wound? And how do you believe that mother wound affected you into your own motherhood, becoming a mother, especially with um, Granny and all the things that she was as a person? How do you um, how do you think that affected you going into motherhood? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I. To define the actual wound would be difficult because there are so many. Um, definitely abandonment. Uh, a lot of what I saw growing up with my mom, my mom was like not an affectionate mother, like how I was with you and Triana, like it's like, I love you, you're amazing, you can do anything you want to, like how I try to inspire you guys and to encourage you guys so that you could you know, just be the best version of yourself. I didn't really get that from her. So I feel like a lot of what I struggle with now is a result of her not really, like, I guess, guiding us or like being um, motherly to us, I guess. And I don't think I really, I think as a child, when you are just trying to connect to your parent and you are, um, you don't understand uh, some of the dynamics that go on because you're a child. So a lot of what you're seeing and witnessing and experiencing is is uh, from the perspective of a child. So there's a lot of things that get lost in translation depending on what the circumstances are. With my mom, she wasn't my mom. so that she kind of would play favoritism with uh, a couple of my other siblings. So it was difficult to watch as a child and to try to have an understanding of why your parent is doting on one child, but not, you can't get the same in return. So there would be times where she would, uh, celebrate my other siblings like for their birthdays and things like that but we didn't get that me and Damie had one birthday party our entire lives as children and my sister is the one who did that for us like she did a surprise party for us and had all the neighborhood kids come over and hide in the basement and then we came home from bike riding and everybody was down there waiting on us and you know she had bought a cake and just all of these things and literally the only time things were done for us was when our when me and my twin brother when our siblings when our older siblings did something for us then we we would be acknowledged or there would be you know celebrating things like that but just on gp my mom didn't do that for me and Danny. like she didn't do that for us and we were the babies so it was interesting to see that dynamic play out because she was like that with our older siblings but not with us um we caught the brunt of all the, you know, like spankings and punishments. And, you know, she would like put us on punishment for like an entire summer, just like crazy over the top, <laughs> egregious sorts of, you know, things, uh, parenting techniques. Um, and so a lot of what I saw as a child, um, I saw her be manipulative. I saw her lie. I saw her um, be deceptive. Um, there were a lot of things that she did where it was like she was doing it and it was something that I would witness. And if I questioned it, it would be a, okay, do as I say, not as I do response. And it's kind of like, but I'm a child. So I'm looking at you as the, you're the rubric. You're the master teacher. You're the first thing that I see. You're the first person to teach me how morality works and how good and bad works, right and wrong, light and dark. Like you're the first person to show me that. And she didn't really show us that. It was more so where we would see her like sneak into my dad's wallet or go through his pockets or things like that. Um, she would get on us about the lying 
Like literally, my mom, she had punishment for lying when she thought we weren't telling the truth. She would literally have us hold hot sauce in our mouth. Like just take a big old spoon, just take the hot sauce and be like, you know, pour it in your mouth. Don't swallow it. Hold that in your mouth. That's the reason why to this day I don't I don't I don't care for spicy foods. <laughs> like I don't care for spicy foods. I I am not a, a hot sauce aficionado. Like I don't put hot sauce on my chicken and my catfish and, and on my greens. And I, that's not that's not I don't have that that part of my black card is 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 muted. It's blo- it's blocked. Because <laughs> she would tell us not to lie, and then we would sit there and listen to her lying about other people on the phone. Just a lot. Just a lot of contradictory sort of you know parenting things so for me I think there was so much that happened with her where I felt just as a child or as an individual as a daughter I did not feel loved by her and she knew that she knew that I didn't feel loved by her so a lot of times um like once I became an adult and me and your dad got married and I had you and Triana like she tried a little bit to be a little bit more like, oh, we're family type of thing. But um, that was short lived, you know, like that didn't really last long once she found out that your dad knew (laughs) that we were, that we were adopted because she used to tell him, it was so much, oh God, she used to just do these like little things. And I don't know if she was doing that to make herself seem more like, to if it was like bragging on herself to make herself seem more like a like of a a better mom or something because she always used to tell this story about um me and Damie breastfeeding but she wasn't our mom like she never breastfed us so she would just lie like she she would lie about she would lie about everything and so every story every mention when we were children all of that stuff was lies. Like to this day, I still do not have a complete picture of everything that happened um, just across the board, like with our family and stuff like that. Like, I didn't even think, I did not discover I was that we were adopted until like I was eight, 18. Maybe 17, 17 or 18 is when I found out. But Damien had known for a while because because my sisters had told him because he was staying with them and we were getting a, like a survivor's check and everything like that. So he was staying with one of our other one of our older siblings and that sibling decided, OK, well, we need the check because you eating us out of house and home and we have children, too. So they decided to tell him and they got the adoption paperwork, tricked my mom into giving it to them and got the adoption paperwork and showed it to Damien. And he already knew, like he was aware, but he didn't say anything because he just said, he was like, I didn't really know how to tell you. And I, you know, and I was just like, okay, you know, but when I found out, it kind of explained why she was the way she was with us. Um, But I think a lot of that, I mean, still to this day, me and Damien talk about how we feel like, um, to an extent we were blamed for our mom being dead because had she not had me and Damien she wouldn't have got sick and then my our father would not have murdered her so had those circumstances not occurred um then she might still be here we just will never know but a lot of times we felt like possibly the family blamed us for our mom being gone because our dad poisoned her like he straight just unalive her because he was mad at her because she stood up to him and he would try to like you know bully her uh verbally physically and she's like you know telling him like you can do whatever you want to do to me but you're not going to do that to me in front of my daughters because you know me and Damien are the babies of seven so uh, we have five older sisters Um, And she would just tell him, like, this is before she got pregnant with us. And she's like, I'm not going to let you hit me in front of them. I'm not going to let you beat on me in front of them. You can do whatever you want to when they're not around. But if I got my babies, you can't be doing all of that. And he did not listen to her. That was a boundary that she, that when he crossed it, she shot him in the head. (laughs) And then called the cops. Like, hey, (laughs) I just shot, you know, my my boyfriend. I need y'all to send an ambulance. So they came. 
they got him in the ass. They were carting him into the ambulance. She's going with him. She like, hey, I shot you. I'm gonna come with you. Make sure you're okay. And he told her then, like, I'm gonna get you back. I'm gonna get you back. And but because she was so, you know, like he knew that she meant that. And so he waited until she was vulnerable and she couldn't really defend herself. And that's when he he poisoned her. Like she was, it was after she had me and Damien and he, she asked him if he could go get her medicine because she wound up getting pneumonia after she had us. And he went and got her medicine. He poisoned her medicine, gave her the medicine. She took the medicine and he literally watched her die, like watched her bubbling at the mouth, struggling to breathe foam coming out of her mouth and my siblings are sitting there watching her die so it's like you know i never, I knew, they, I never knew they watched her die I never knew yeah that. yeah they watched her die and that's the reason why it was like when we first when i first got told we were adopted and they were like okay you know we're your, your, your real mother you know she died after she you know she died after she had you and so now i'm talking to Damien I'm like well where's our dad like is our real dad alive like it just it was there's this it's just a desire to know where you come from it's a desire to know what you're made of it's a desire to know to possibly have a parent that actually does love you that does not make you feel like a burden and when we would you know like ask about that or speak about that you know our siblings would be like no he's the reason why mama's not here so we're not going to give you no information on him you don't need to know about him he's a murderer and it's just like okay well we didn't know that like when were you, when was y'all gonna tell us the, you know like it was like even in them allegedly telling us the truth we were still being lied to there was still information that was being withheld for purposes of protecting us or protecting the other party so it's like even now still i don't know and if everything <laughs> you know that i do think i know is true i don't know as you were telling your story do you sometimes feel that maybe i never thought about it that way that granny and the family would blame you and hang you for your mom dying but do you ever think that maybe also too granny felt like she could manipulate you guys better because you guys technically were like babies all of your older siblings they were older so they're they're kind of like less easier to mold in a way because they still had that relationship to your mom but for you guys you guys were babies and so it was kind of like okay well these they're babies and they they're not really aware of what's going on so let me manipulate them as if they are actually my own children. I would say yes to that. Um, and I do feel like that, uh, that it was, uh, it was very calculated on her part with that because she wanted people to believe that we were her children, that we were her real children. Like that we, you know, that she had birthed us and, you know, we, we were, that we looked the way that we did because of her like that's what she wanted people to believe and so it was such a deep-rooted secret that if we spoke about it like if we spoke about our other siblings in front of other people like not family neighbors or whatever we got in trouble for that i remember the neighbor next door was by and she was asking me she was saying something to me and I just, I just answered her truthfully, but because my mama didn't want her to know the truth, she like, she was like doing something. I don't know if she was like sewing something on me or she was like fixing something. But all I remember is her pinching the mess out of me. And I mean, that mess hurt. And I was like, ouch. And she looked at me like, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what is, I thought, I didn't lie. What are we, what are we doing right now? You know what I'm saying? Like. I would get in trouble for being honest and she didn't like that and it was it would just be so many times where it would just be stuff where i'm just like i'm trying to figure it out too like why are you upset about me saying something about this or whatever and um it was such a prolific lie and it had such a like immense hold over like the entire family there was a i had a cousin on my dad's side and she was bipolar schizophrenic 
and she took medicine for it. I didn't know any of this until, of course, I was an adult, but as a child, I just thought she was weird. Like, I didn't feel comfortable around her. I was afraid of her because she was very odd acting. Um, but she really was harmless. Like, she would get, she was quick to anger, but again, that was because she was bipolar. And if she wasn't taking her medicine and she didn't really, like, wasn't, like, on top of it, like, with her diet and she didn't exercise or anything like that, it would just be really bad for her. So I would be kind of leery about being around her. But because of how she was, my mom manipulated her and she would like have her come by and she would spend a lot of time with her. And so she became her confidant. My mom became my this particular cousin's confidant. And but that cousin was like, you know, she just it was certain things that she just was unaware of and she didn't understand about my mom. And so I remember, oh. She went to go get her hair done. Her and my mom had the same hairstyles. And she would go to get her hair done by this lady. And in the process of her going to t- to see this lady get her hair done, the lady asked about my mom. And so my cousin's like, oh, yeah, she's fine. You know, her, she's, she's doing well. And so the lady, like, asked her about one of us or something. And she's like, yeah, but that's not their mama, so it don't really matter. She's like, what? And the stylist is like, wait, what you mean? That's not their mama. She's like, they adopted. She like, none of them are, are their kids. She's like, none of them. She adopted all of them. Those are all her, you know, all she like, they're family members, but those are not her birth children. Those are not her real children, but she is related to their, their birth parents. So the stylist is like, what? Like, but she don't believe it, right? Because she know that this particular cousin is a little, you know, so she mentions it to my mom and my mom still lies about it and then says well she's crazy like she don't know what she's talking about even and she she is you know she was certifiable but my mom used that as an excuse like she's like yeah she's she crazy don't listen to her she don't know what she's talking about but then she turned around and stopped talking to her so my so my cousin would come by like she would try to come by just to apologize because she didn't know that her saying something to the stylist was going to cause this uproar, you know, from because now my mom is caught in a lie. And what do most people who get caught in a lie do? They don't want to cop to it. They don't want to admit that what they're saying is, you know, is wrong. So she didn't do that. She basically you know, my, my cousin came by to see my mom and she came, my mom went to the door and my cousin's like, I'm sorry, you know, can I just, can we just talk? And my mom's like, no, I don't have anything else to say to you. Don't come back here no more. I don't never want to see you again. And she closed the door in her face and locked it. And my cousin went and committed suicide that very, uh, it might've been maybe a week later. And when she committed suicide, she put in the note, you know, Auntie Marcel, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't mean to, you know, do what I did. It wasn't intentional. I wasn't, I didn't mean to hurt you. Like she felt so bad and she killed herself. And my mom just, you know, and even, even with that happening, she still did not, she didn't hold, she didn't, she didn't hold herself accountable for what happened. Nothing. And then when after the family, went after the, cause that was on my dad's side of the family. She went after them for like, funeral expenses that you know she helped them pay for or whatever like she got an attorney to like send them a letter like a cease and desist or something crazy just crazy just just no integrity that's what I grew up seeing and so I had to try to like train myself I guess I mean lucky for me and Dami we had my sister Gina so she was kind of like our protector when we were little so she was the one who my mama like doted on and loved and adored so it would be like she would kind of protect us from our mom you know ultimately when my mom like she did so much (laughs) she just did so much it would be it would be like all night we would be talking about everything that she did and these are things that I witnessed these are things that I saw and so I was always like because that's what I saw with her and growing up and everything. I was always second guessing myself. Like, am, am I doing this right? You know, like even now, because I would I would just try to protect myself from her. 
so I have a what do they call it like a reactive um, style when someone is like if I'm not like I'll be afraid to ask for stuff like my job is a perfect example I spoke to a supervisor yesterday that supervisor did not do what they were supposed to do I know that they did not do what they were supposed to do and I instantly like my anxiety just took over and I was instantly just like upset and mad and just like trying to figure out like why is this happening in this moment like I'm tired of this happening because it keeps happening and when those things happen I'm just like like I have to catch myself because I am instantly feeling like okay like a child again like I'm not getting what I want and I don't know how to say what I need to say so that I don't get in any trouble right so and then you know with this particular where I'm at they kind of like they remind me, it's like they remind me of my mom because they're vindictive, you know, they hold grudges, they try to get back at you, just little dumb stuff. And it's like, we're adults, like we're adults. You guys are management, do better. Like just, it doesn't have to be this. So I can see even now, like when I'm dealing with, you know, other people, authority figures, um, I, I get scared. Like I get anxious. Like if I have to interact and I just feel like, there's a breakdown in communication then it's just like dang like why is this happening like what is you know like what's going on with this or whatever you know so um i do feel like uh a lot of what i saw i had to unlearn and i think with you and you and triana that you guys helped me with that because i remember where were we at we were over there on calumet this is when we were in the bigger apartment like where you guys had your own rooms and everything and I remember I don't know if you guys remember this but you guys went to Wisconsin with your godmother came back she would not tell me what y'all did that was so horrible but she just made it seem like y'all was complete hellions on the trip and so now I'm upset because I'm like, okay, now y'all causing a problem with me and my friend and I don't know and ain't nobody telling me the truth and, you know, nobody would cop to nothing. But I remember when I was spanking you guys in that moment that I was like really upset and I just remembered that that's how my mom used to be with us. And I'm like, why are you like, you don't even know what happened and you try to beat them within an inch of their lives. And I told y'all that day, I don't know if y'all remember this. I told y'all that day I would never spank y'all again and I didn't. I didn't spank y'all no more after that incident. And it was just like, for me to take that step back and just be like, okay, no, this is not how you want to be with your children. Like you don't want your children to fear you. You want them to respect you, but not to be afraid of you. And so even now, you know, I struggle with that, like trying not to, because I don't want to break your spirit. I do want y'all to respect me. (laughs) <laughs> but I don't want to break your spirit in, in pursuit of that because to me it's not that serious it's just kind of like you know you guys are adults and it's like you, you're going to challenge me just like you challenge your dad like it's expected but you know but I, I think like, but I think too that that's the that's that's what I was saying in the beginning that's the beauty of it because I do feel like at times when growing up I think it was more so not necessarily it was more so fear of how you would react to react to the situation, not necessarily what you would say. It was more so the fear of like, oh, I'm, I know my mom, she gonna react, she gonna blow up. And so, but I think as of recently, like I remember when my arrest situation happened and when I finally told you and I heard your reaction, I'm, I'm tensing up on the inside waiting for you to blow up. And when you gave me, what you, when you said what you said, and I was like, She didn't blow up on me. She was actually compassionate. I mean, y'all are so full of it. I don't blow up on y'all often anyway. No, I'm not often, but I think there's sometimes, something very wrong in that moment. <laughs> we could be, I think sometimes we sometimes were afraid to like disappoint y'all. So when we feel like in our minds, when we like messing up or doing something that got we got ourselves to a situation where we shouldn't have. I think that's more so of like because we want to we want to we don't want to make you not proud of us so when something happens 
it's kind of like I don't know it's kind of like to me on the inside I naturally well I've kind of realized that I naturally am anxious about things so I'm more anxious about what I think is going to happen instead of just allowing myself to flow through it and go through the situation if that makes sense so I think you're trying to both do that though you're both scared of what you think my reaction is going to be because you don't want to disappoint me and I'm like I if I'm disappointed, it's very brief. Like, because I always ask you, okay, so when you made that decision, what? why did you make that decision? Why was that the choice that you went with? So it's not like I'm just like, oh, you suck. Do better. Like, no. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll ask you, like, okay, so you made that decision because why? Why did you think that was in your highest interest, you know, to go with or whatever? But, but, I, I, think, but that, I think, and I think also, too, for me, I think also when it came when it came to like me challenging you or Triana challenging you, I think in a way, because like you said, for you, you've had problems. Like when you, when you encounter authority figures, you're afraid to like you're afraid of like that, not necessarily the confrontation, or you're afraid of the the setback that comes with it. I think also that was me in a sense when when I would get into certain situations with like a boss or like a teacher or something, kind of like afraid to like advocate for myself and my needs and what I need in the moment. So I think sometimes in the moments where I did challenge you, I feel like in the moment you taught me to stand up for myself outside of those situations because sometimes, like I said, I don't, I don't say we fear what you would say it was more so like the reaction that would come with it so i think more so now i I feel like you kind of you taught me to stand up and advocate for myself but also um not necessarily prepare for the worst but be okay with the reactions and kind of like be present in the moment if that makes sense so when you found out you were going to be a mother how do you think those experiences with your mom manifested in your upbringing and then also how do you think that affected you in your relationships in uh, navigating motherhood I think I was terrified because she always used to say oh I can't wait till you have kids so you can see what I had to go through and I, I was so scared that y'all was just going to be, you know, like problem kids. Because she made it seem like, oh, you're going you, you gonna to reap what you sold and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, okay, one, I wasn't really even that bad of a child. You had a problem with what you thought I was doing, not the other way, you know, like the other way around or whatever. Like I wasn't actually doing anything like that was like overwhelmingly bad like the stuff that she would get upset with us about it would just be her anger was just just overwhelming like and it was un i could not understand like when she would do some stuff she would do i'm like where is this coming from like why i don't understand why you're doing this why are you so you know just the way you are but i feel like when i had you guys that uh all of that fear just left like I wasn't scared anymore when I had you and then you know because I nursed both of you and you know we had that bond and just I didn't have any like other let me see my sister my sister Gina is the reason why I breastfed because I watched her breastfeed your cousin Bianca um so that kind of helped but my mom, she wasn't really like present with you guys. Like when you guys were babies, like um, it would be more so like I wanted her to be, but she wasn't. She was more present with Bianca, with your cousin, than she was with you guys. And that was that was upsetting to me too, but it was expected just because of how she was with Gina. So of course she's going to be like that with her daughter. But um, I feel like When I was pregnant with you, like all my siblings got together and they 
did like a baby shower and they got me like this really nice uh where they all put in on it but it was like they got me like this really nice like uh stroller carriage like thing for you and i was so happy because me me and your daddy baby we was broke when we got pregnant with you i think i was making like how much was i making i think i was making like six dollars and 45 cents an hour or something crazy like i was not making a lot of money at all i swear to god and then i got um promoted to PBX and I was making like eight dollars and like 25 cents an hour and I was just so happy like oh finally I'm making more money like now I be like <laughs> I done had a whole family raise two two children on eight dollars and 25 cents an hour like and then you, you were working at the hotel so our hours were not guaranteed because of you know like when it got cold you know hotels in Chicago at least they would not have as many people coming to stay so we would lose hours in the winter time because it wouldn't be as many people coming so your dad would have to go like get unemployment and i would be the only one working and so it would just be hard but you guys made it easy because y'all wasn't bad you you guys are still like good kids like and i'm happy like when you guys are not here but you come visit or even when you're not here like everybody be like when Marshawn and Triana coming to visit when they coming back to Texas so you know I always tell people like I'm lucky I'm like because people look for my kids like they're eager to see my children I hear nothing but good things about my children like I don't get I don't have those types of issues like you know with some of my like other my other girlfriends that had children when they were when we were the same age like we had kids in the same age group they didn't have babies and some everything like so you know <laughs> like I looked up. My kids are both still doing well. They're both healthy, you know, and I and you guys inspire me too. So it's an even exchange of, you know, love and affection and, you know, encouragement and nourishment, nourishing and, you know, just nurturing all of those things. Like I get that. So um, I have to remember, you know, that you guys are are were my blessing like you guys helped me to become a better version of myself unlearn all of the things that i learned that i saw with my mom and my dad because my dad while he was not abusive he was um not emotionally there like he wasn't like he like <laughs> we would he would my mom would take us with her to watch him to like catch him cheating on her just crazy stuff and it would just it would just be so weird because you know to think about it now it's just like wait 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 how like why would you take us with you to see that i tell you like a, a lot of times we did not feel like she cared because in our minds we was just like why would you do this why would you take your children to do that or whatever and then um just like um the only time i ever felt like she would protect me is when she caught Tony raping me. Like when she caught Tony, like literally on top of me and she like hit him in the head with a skillet. And then she called the police and then she just kind of like put me in the tub and she was like, are you okay? And just, you know, like that was the only time I ever felt like she cared. But then it was kind of tempered by the fact that she couldn't stand Tony anyway. Like she was, look, she was waiting on something, something to get him on. Cause you know, that was daddy's, you know, cheap baby. That was the baby he had on her while they was, you know, together. And so she did not, you know, care for, for Tony. She did not want him around. Um, and I think when she found out that he had been molesting me, you know, that just kind of gave her ammunition to get him out the house. So it wasn't, even in that moment, it was not, it wasn't, I didn't feel like, you know, as an adult now, I look at it from the perspective of, Oh, she wasn't, she didn't really care. She was, she cared that, you know, she had a ammunition to get Tony out the house. It wasn't like, oh, you know, what he did to Nina was so wrong. Because what happened when I was, when your, when your uncle Damien moved out the house and I was there by myself, she let Tony move back in. So she let the dude that raped me move back into the house. <laughs> Did not ask me if I was okay with it. Did not ask me if I was uncomfortable with it. Nothing. And interestingly enough, what I 
learned about myself at least is that a lot of things that like so much so much stuff happened in my childhood that I block out a lot of stuff like some stuff I don't remember I just won't recall it because I'm, on purpose my mind is like protecting me and won't let me remember it so it's kind of like with Tony um that whole scenario had kind of I had kind of like blocked that out and then it was just like one time your auntie Gina was like oh you know um how do you feel about Tony being back in the house and I'm like Am I supposed to feel some type of way about it? Like, he in the basement. I'm upstairs. I don't care. You know. And she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. You know, and she's like, so it doesn't bother you? Like, you don't feel uncomfortable? You know, do mama be leaving you here by yourself with him or whatever? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't understand why I don't understand these questions. And so then she's just like, you don't remember? And I'm like, remember what? What am I supposed to be remembering here? And she's like, oh, you know, she's like, you remember what Tony did to you? And it just was like, even when she said it, it still took me a minute. I'm just like, I still don't know what you're talking about, but okay. But then it was like, after she, after she brought it up, that's when I started to have like recollections and remember. And I'm just like, oh, damn. And so then I'm like feeling some type of way. Cause like, why you let him move back in here? <laughs> like, what was that? You know what I'm saying? But she thrived on doing stuff for people so that they would owe her and so she could hold that over their heads like well i did this for you and yada 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 so even with that i struggle not trying not to do that and it's like i have um like when i joined master force mushim su had asked me like when i was like talking to her like right on our very first meeting or whatever and she was like oh you know she's like okay well we need to uh recognize why you do that why are you so giving why are you so you know you just do anything for anybody why are you you know and i'm like what you mean like what well, there's a why to this like there was a reason why i do this and she's like yeah and i'm like oh i didn't know that and so when she started like going over those things with me and like you know when i was going through the course it just helped me like you know like she helped me figure out and acknowledge like you do things you do those things because you did not feel you know like loved or you didn't feel like you know you got what you needed as a child so as an adult you know you're still trying to compensate and so you do things for people you are a people pleaser like you're doing those things because you want people to like you You want people to acknowledge you you want people to validate you that you matter that you you know that you're important and she was right and that really sucked and so it was like after i did that you know i kind of stopped <laughs> stopped being a people pleaser like um i started setting more healthy boundaries with people so even now i have a boundary that i had to put in place you know with somebody that i care about but because i care about myself more and i understand that in order for me to be able to move forward and to heal that the situation where i felt like my boundary was crossed more than once after I had already said something. It's like, now I'm just kind of like, okay, now that person has shown you that they don't care about that boundary. So are you going to allow that person to continue to cross the boundary or do you just simply don't engage with that person anymore? And I think for me, because I don't have many people that I care about like that or that I um, feel like you know, I don't have a lot of people. I don't have a very large circle. So my circle is very small. And so it is difficult for me to, for somebody that I really care about, it's difficult for me to just X that person out of my life. I will do it though, if I feel like it's not in my highest interest to allow them to stay. And in this moment, I feel like it's not in my highest interest to allow this individual to stay. And so they must go. So with the complexities of forgiveness and reconciliation how do you navigate that um and how do you how do you go about navigating that space with like like we were speaking on just for working to forgive your parent and healing from what happened to you by your parent well i don't know sometimes i feel like i have not forgiving my mom I still I still harbor a lot of um anger towards her um even with me having a better understanding even with me um you know reading what was the book uh your soul's plan by Robert Schwartz 
that was the first book I read that kind of like put me on guard like not on guard necessarily but it just had me like pause because I'm like wait a minute so you're saying I agree to this like I had a soul contract with my mom to to do this to be you know unloving to be um not nurturing to uh, be callous to be cold-hearted to manipulate to isolate um I asked her to do this like before I incarnated why would I do that <laughs> so that would of course be the complexities of you know the universe you know having a human experience in allowing these uh, lessons to occur for you know ascension so even having that understanding it's still you know it still is is can be uh hard i'll say but i'll show you something since we're talking about that so i went to go i went to go do a an aura reading right so this is my this was my aura reading that i had i don't know how to hold it um, but when I got the oral reading done, you know, the, the guy's like, so, you know, did you lose somebody recently? And I'm like, actually, I did. I was like, I'd lost my godmother who I really cared about. I said, and, you know, she was just uh, a beautiful person. And I was like, I just don't know, you know, I understand death. I get it. I know we'll, I'll see her again. Um, but that was really hard because I cared about her and I know she cared about me and she showed me that she cared about me I never questioned you know how she felt about me um, about you guys like you know <laughs> like she treated y'all like y'all was her grandbabies and it's just you know it was just so hard when she passed away and he's just like you know you you gotta he's like i know you know you said you're a life coach you deal with this kind of stuff he's like you're gonna have to release that you know you're gonna have to let that go and i'm like yeah 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 so i'm like i'm a leo of course i'm gonna hold a grudge <laughs> i'm a leo of course i'm gonna be mad for a while i'm a leo of course i don't know how to make my ego smaller like <laughs> that sort of thing but um, I think uh, at some point I will be able to let it completely go. Um, when I look at the state of, you know, like me and my siblings now, it's just hurtful because I feel like I'm alone. I feel like I don't have anybody. And I think the isolation is even worse because I'm down here in Texas and you guys are all up, you know, still in Chicago or whatever. But like I came down here, you know, because I wanted to to be able to spend time with my nephew and to see my twin brother more and that has not happened <laughs> so I'm like do I really want to come back to Chicago I love it down here because I love the weather and I love the peace of mind but you know I miss y'all so you know, we'll see we'll, we'll forgive her and the grudges that I'm currently holding I'll stop holding them that's what I think um, I think I'm, I am actively working towards that. I do speak with my therapist about it at length. And, you know, he does tell me that I need to, you know, just let it go. And then he also told me to stop being an unauthorized rescuer, which I tend to, you know, people be going through something. And I'm just like, oh, you know, and I'll try to offer advice. And he's like, stop doing that. If they don't ask you specifically, then don't put that out there. And I'm like, okay. Do I not? I can't say nothing. He's like, no. I'm like, okay. So it's hard. it's hard. I think eventually I will be in a full place of happiness. When? I don't know. But you're right. It is difficult. And she's not and even I, here. So it's like you think you be over it. <laughs> and I will say, like, for me, when we when we got into our breakdown or around Thanksgiving, I will say that as tough as the conversation was there was a sense there was some healing that i felt from it 
and I felt like, because I remember I was talking to, I feel like, I remember I was talking to daddy about this, and I was telling him, I feel like, I said, I feel like sometimes with mommy, I feel like sometimes she may feel attacked because of what she went through with her mom, and because of, she's not as close with her family, and so I remember telling him, I was like, I feel like with you, sometimes I feel like I have a better sense of who you are because you you are you're close with you're not necessarily super close with your family but there's a closeness with your family and I feel like mommy I feel like sometimes she doesn't have that because of her upbringing and where she came from and I feel like sometimes like I feel like I know you because you know you my mom but I feel like I don't necessarily know like the foundation of what you of, of where you come from and I don't know maybe that's because because you were adopted and because granny was so she could be so hot and cold sometimes and I mm -hmm. feel like the times where I don't know I don't know you don't know this but when I was moving stuff out of the apartment I found your diary from when you were younger and I saw like it was it had one of those prompts in there like Who's your favorite artist? And who's this actor that you find attractive? And just seeing those things, I'm like, wow, my mom is like, it's so it's so interesting to see that about my mom. Like, I never heard like. And so, um, I will say, like, like I said, even with our breakdown, because I feel like sometimes, I feel like sometimes in the past, I feel like you would like, you would get upset. And you would like go off, and I feel like sometimes when looking back at it, because I remember one of the things that we've learned is not to take things personal. Look back at it, I feel like sometimes in the moment you weren't necessarily upset at us when you were triggered by a certain certain thing that would happen, like when we would challenge you. I think that came from when Granny made you feel like you were wrong all the time, or made you feel like you were the bad guy or and you were and you were a child and so looking back on it now as an adult and really like understanding i have a better understanding of why you would go off if that makes sense i had a better understanding of where the upset was coming from if that makes sense um but after we cried after we boo boo cried and stuff there was a sense of like healing like a sense of heaviness that lifted off of my chest and I feel like in a way in a way I grew a stronger um connection to you like I feel like we have a suit we have a strong connection but I feel like even that it it brought me stronger and it and it helped me to look at myself in how I show up in relationships and my friendships I feel like it's helped me show up in show up differently for myself in my own life just just showing me to like I said stand up for myself have more patience but also like also when the with the note not taking things personal that in a way helps you be more empathetic because you I feel like it opens the door for you to understand a person more and why and why they may enact a certain behavior instead of like taking it personal because you want to do it that way but you have to understand that this person may not that person may not have gone through a similar circumstance this helps heal a part of myself that I didn't know needed that and I thank you for that yeah and I thank you for being my teacher in those moments it helps broaden my horizon. It helps me, you know, with my purpose. And it's, it, I think it shows that anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Like, anything is possible. And if you operate in love, even when, even in the midst of upset, if you operate in love, you can, there can be healing from those types of situations. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I just feel like you're not always going to get the easy. And that if you keep encountering things that are triggering for you, um, that means that there's still some healing that needs to take place. And so I know <laughs> there's definitely still some healing that needs to take place exactly in what arena. I don't know 
yet. I'm hoping to get more insight into that as I continue um, with my therapist. So we'll see. I know I probably did not have a name for, I didn't know I dealt with anxiety. I didn't know, you know, even though, well, yes, I did to an extent. Because a lot of times, and I don't even think your dad will never know this probably, but it was like when we split, I used to have so many anxiety attacks because I literally just, I felt guilty. I felt um, like a failure. I felt like uh, there was so much more we could have done to like save our save our marriage and things of that nature. And it was like when we did it, I just felt like, you know, like I, I didn't do what I was supposed to do for him. And, you know, even with that, it was like, it took a minute for me to really understand, you know, what he was going through. Because I think I was taking his, 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 lack of you know wanting to still be married I think I was taking it personal but you know now of course I understand and I you know empathize with him but I think initially I was just like man like you just don't want to try like you're not even trying you know so I think for me that trigger is still there and I'm still trying to figure out how to you know tame it and get it under control um okay so that leads into the last question that I have is what tools would you give for people to begin healing from their mother wounds and um, breaking the cycle of that in their family? I would recommend two books. Three. The Children of the Lie. I cannot remember the author, but that book. Um, Your Soul's Plan by Robert Schwartz. And The Four Agreements by Miguel Ruiz, I think. Ruiz, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but um, I would recommend those three books for like daily reading um, because I think to get a different perspective or to get a different outcome, you have to look at things from a a different perspective. Um, Otherwise, you kind of go through life with that burden. It's kind of like you don't have an opportunity to get to get rid of it because you don't have any tools to do so. Um, I think reading those books will allow you an opportunity to get out of having a victim mindset. So I'm not a victim. You know, I agree to my mom being evil to me and unloving and all of those things, because had she not done that, I mean, who's to say I if I would have been able to flip the script and, you know, kind of stop that generational curse, at least on my end, uh, so that you guys could have, you know, healthier um, dialects and upbringing with, you know, me and your dad. Um, Also, definitely the recapitulation every evening, just like touching bases and checking in with your feelings, making sure you're writing them down. I would recommend that to anybody. Everybody thinks keeping a diary is silly, but it's really not because it gives you an opportunity to get your thoughts down and for you to see, you know, what's actually happening with you and what's going on with you. Um, What else? If your mom is still here um, and you know that that relation is toxic, be okay with walking away from the relationship and not feeling obligated to stay in contact with someone who has consistently tore you down or not made you feel loved. Um, I think people kind of struggle with that. It's almost like, but that's my mom. Okay. Is she motherly to you? Does she um, embody what a mom is so that you feel like, you know, you feel that she's your mom, that you're nurtured, that you're loved. Um, And if you don't, then be okay with walking away from that relationship. Um, I think a lot of people, just because of the title, they'll they'll remain in toxic relationships or toxic family, familial uh, relationships. And that's an unhealthy dynamic because you stay in a place of always, you know, either trying to prove yourself to that person because you you're you desire their love and you're looking for it, you're seeking it. And so you'll do things to try to get their attention or to, you know, at least appeal to them in whatever way you feel like you can to get a a positive uh, a positive interaction as opposed to what you're accustomed to with that person Um, definitely not feeling not um, 
not staying a victim, um, having the difficult conversations and being okay with that outcome, whatever that looks like. If that person does not, you know, forgive you back or they don't accept your apology or whatever that looks like, be okay with that. Be okay with not um, trying to control the narrative or to control the outcome. Because if your intentions are pure and you're coming from a place of love, at least for yourself, then the outcome doesn't matter because you did what you needed to do in order to correct and to um, isolate the negativity so that you could have a, <laughs> a better um, relationship with that person, either whether it be your mom or your daughter or you know things of that nature. You just want to always put yourself in a position of power. And how you do that is by getting the knowledge that you need to get in order to understand the dynamics of what happened with your childhood. Um, I guess I can say I'm I'm lucky. I don't do a lot of um, escaping, so to speak. I don't like to drink and all of those things. Um, so when I'm having a moment, I just have to dwell in it and kind of uh, meditate through it <laughs> and hope for uh, positive uh uh, meditation session so that I can, you know, feel a little bit better. Um, definitely you and Triana have inspired me to be more uh, consistent, with, excuse me, consistent with my exercising and everything because you guys are very, excuse me, devoted to that. I Like I said, the stuff that I see you guys do now and I never thought, you know, like when you were younger and I was trying to get you guys to go do it and stuff and I'd just be like, they don't listen. They just don't listen. And now it's like to see you guys be adults and to do everything that I've taught you. Like as far as like, you know, like, you know, like when your asthma is acting up, you will go vegan. You won't eat no dairy. You stay away from stuff that could cause mucus. You know, like you know what to do. And these are things that these are tools that I gave you guys. And so I'm just always very happy <laughs> that I was able to do that for you all. But um, I, everybody's not going to be like us, you know. I think that we do very well at acknowledging uh, our hurts and when there is something, you know, like if there are hurt feelings or something, even though we may not be able to have that discussion right then and there, we do have the discussion. So we're able to have those hard conversations. And I'm grateful for that because I feel like um, I have, I still have things to learn being your mom and I'm cool with that. Now just, you know. I feel like too with that, I was gonna say, um, I would say another tool is being open to not being right in the in the conversation, but being open to instead of working to be right, because that's the ego, we're working towards understanding. Yeah. And I think that's the bigger thing, is that I think also with the family uh, uh, I don't know but I can't speak for other family other family dynamics but in black, black family dynamics I feel like sometimes there's more so uh, scenario. well let me not say just black family dynamics in family dynamics people are working to be right and to prove their point and I think the good thing about us our family and what you and daddy have instilled in us is to find the understanding and I think that bridges the better that bridges a better connection to for all of us to heal and have a better family relationship yeah I agree and I think that your dad he's so he's just so mild mannered like <laughs> it was one of the things that like I really liked about him because I was like fiery and he was just kind of like you know how your daddy is. It's not that serious. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, he's just like, chill, whatever it is or whatever. So um, I think you guys got a lot of that from him because, child, your mama firecracker, okay? All right. <laughs> I mama, I just want to thank you again for coming on, for being open, for being transparent, for having this conversation. I'm just thankful for you coming on and seeing your experiences and just you know lending a voice because i don't think a lot of people a lot of parent and child can have this type of conversation yeah. and so um yeah i just appreciate you coming on i appreciate the growth amongst the both of us and i appreciate my relationship with you and i love you oh i love you too 
and I appreciate you guys too. You guys definitely keep me on my toes, so and not in a bad way. No, you keep me on my toes. Very grateful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the end of this episode for Friendship Full Circle. If you can like, comment, and share this episode where it is streaming and available. If you connect to this episode or if you have a mother wound that you want to heal from, leave it down in the comment section below. If you have any questions for my mom, because she is a life coach as well, leave those questions down in the comment section below too. Until next time, peace and blessings. I hope this brings you the healing and opens you to reconnect with yourself and heal your own mother wounds. So until next time, until the next Punch Full Circle, peace and blessings, and we're out. <laughs> <laughs>